Hey guys, good afternoon, I'm here. Good afternoon, everybody. Hello everyone, welcome. Um, we will be giving five minutes for the rest of the audience to join and then we'll be starting today's session. Thank you for waiting.
All right, so welcome everyone, and welcome back to Saturday for SPE 2.0. Today is our second Saturday of the month, whereby we're presenting you our second technical talk. So this program has been brought to you mainly by SPE Asia Pacific University Student Chapter and SPE Kuala Lumpur Young Professional Section, and many other collaborations with different student chapters and sections around the globe. Long story short, today we will be targeting petroleum economics. So welcome on board again and let's get started. So my name is Mayang Sindali. Uh, I am a final year petroleum engineering student. I'm currently doing my internship and I'm also the head of communication of SP Asia Pacific University student chapter. And today I will be your moderator for this session. So let's move forward to today's agenda. So 
we are setting our token with a short safety moment, followed by a membership awareness, then a team introduction. After that, we are introducing today's speaker, who will be targeting why learning petroleum economics, from technical inputs to economic, uh, economic indicators, to oil and gas contract and fiscal systems, economical indicators. Then we are moving to a question and answer session. So please, we advise you to drop your questions in the meeting chat box. Our technical team will go through it by order. Don't forget to mention your name and organization when you type your question down. After the question and answer session, we're moving to a fun Kahoot game session that will be presented by my teammate, Glory. After that, we're having a photo session. So we also advise you for the photo session to use the virtual background that the technical team will also be dropping in the meeting chat box. And please turn on your video, put on a big smile and to have a more interactive session. So after our photo session, there will be a feedback form that will ask you to fill to receive your certificate of participation. And finally, a closing remarks by today's speaker. So starting the session by the safety moment. The safety moment will be presented by my teammate, Mr. Amir. Mr. Amir. Thank you, Mariam. And uh, hello and welcome everybody again. I uh, hope you are doing well. Uh, let's begin uh, today's meeting with uh, focus on safety first. So we are all um, probably working from home. Uh, so one good thing that we should all uh, be talking about is ergonomics. So what is ergonomics? Right now we are sitting behind a laptop screen. How are we seated, right? Um, ergonomics is just the science and art of fitting the job and the workplace to a worker's needs. So right now we are workers in a sense, we are sitting. So let's just take a quick glance at how we are seating, right? Take a look wherever you are, make sure your posture is right. You're not hurting your back. Everything looks fine on your end, right? And the other thing is take care of your eyes. So for your eyes, there's a 20, 20, 20 rule. So every 20 minutes, look at something which is around 20 feet away for 20 seconds. So that way your eyes are adjusting and they're not just glued to maybe your you know, smartphone, your laptop, you know, in one direction. So take care of these two things, okay? Additionally, uh, we are in the middle of a pandemic. So just a quick reminder to everybody, please wear your masks, wear your gloves, uh, wash hands wherever uh, and whenever necessary. Um, because at the end of the day, whatever you do in this meeting, after this meeting, whenever you're going out to get something, etc., whatever you do will decide if you and your near ones can live together happily in the future, right? So that is the thought that I will leave you all with um, in the next slide. So just remember uh, to do what is right all the time, all right? I'll hand it back to uh, my kind host, Mariam, and she can take us forward. Thanks. Thank you, Amir. Um, moving forward to a membership drive that will be presented by my teammate, Leonard. Yes. Thank you, everyone. To, before I begin, let me briefly introduce myself. I'm Leonard Chu from Harawat University in Malaysia, student chapter. And next slide, please. As you all know, um, uh, why SP membership? Uh, I would say that SP uh, membership, they have a lot of different benefits for everyone. And this is a membership recruitment, right? And also to share and boost the awareness to uh, at least in our local KL section. Next slide, please. So on the left side, these are just the basic uh, benefit that was listed out in, uh, in terms of the SPE membership, such as on the top left is the League of Volunteers, uh, attending local session meeting, distinguished lecture. Some of it, I can even watch the on-demand recordings. Of course, Energy for Me, which is a CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, uh, towards the high school student and also STEM education. Of course, e-mentoring and SPE Connect are community uh, perks, I would say, where you get to talk and discuss to uh, connect with the community while at the same time grow together internationally and globally. And of course, we also stay current with the current technology such as Project GPD, Journal of Petroleum Technology, One Petrol, and SP Online Education. And of course, uh, needless to say, the SP events, uh, both internationally, locally, or maybe even uh, globally. And in terms of professional benefit, we benefit a lot spending from mentorship pro mentoring programs, ambassador lecture, Distinguished Lecture Series, a volunteer opportunity in SPE, 
and of course, <clears throat> visibility to professional and organizations, and of course, free education and learning opportunity, uh, PE accreditation, professional engineering accreditation, uh, young professional development program, professional networking, trainings, workshop, technical career guidance programs and talks, and of course, community of practice uh, at Met Energy, and uh, free access to SP paper six annually. Next slide. And this is the list of our past SPEKL activities. As you can see, we are very active, spanning from mentoring programs, uh, mentor members in transitions, IP sharing sessions, SP workshops, conferences, and of course, uh, various community outreach, industrial collaboration, and also dis <clears throat> distinguished lectures. Next slide, please. So for students, uh, I believe we all know, students receive a free membership as our uh, membership free is uh, waived by Jeff Rod. And what we benefit, uh, what we enjoy from is uh, receive mentoring, uh, scholarship and fellowship opportunity, retro ball competition, student paper contest, and if you'd like to, you can uh, reach out for career guidance, and of course, even join virtual field trips. Please. And we are providing extra benefit during the pandemic. The first thing, there will be free renewal of membership for those who lost their jobs. And the second is an insurance program for SP members, especially those who are transitioning from students to professional membership or current graduation. We can even receive the first year of SP professional membership for free. And if any question, we just need to ask. This is the table of the breakdown of the fees, like after one year after graduation, and also uh, two years after graduation, and so on and so forth. And next slide, please. So this is just a list to um, remind everyone also to let everyone know what is the extra benefit. The first thing, that reduce the fee at least by 50% for Malaysia. And the second fee, uh, the second thing is that there are free renewable, uh, renewal of membership for those who have lost their job. And the third is insurance program for SP members. And next slide, please. So of course, without, just, not just the benefit, even from our local section, we are providing the uh, lucky draw to boost this membership registration, registration. So for the first thing, is there is a lucky draw for the physical gift. And of course, the second thing is an opportunity to present at one of SPEKL activities or events. And of each month, there will be two winners. So take note yeah. of that. And moving on to the next one. This is a bit in terms of student membership and also the professional membership. Thank you. And so if I were you, I will register today and um, try and win, stand a chance to win the <clears throat> lucky draw under the membership. So remember to register at least before 24th of December to our SPEKL membership chairperson, uh, Miss Fatima. And with that, um, next step is, uh, let me share with you before I end my presentation, is an upcoming SPE uh, flagship event, which is ATCE. It stands for Annual Technical Conference and Exhibition. This is held in Dubai World Trade Center and is happening hybrid on 21st to 23rd this, uh, September. Feel free to explore uh, the rates. If you are joining virtually, I believe it will be in an affordable price. And next slide, please. And that, I shall end my membership awareness uh, or membership drive presentation. SP welcomes you. Thank you. Thank you, Leona, for this informative pre presentation. Uh, moving forward, um, now we are introducing the team that worked behind uh, this session. So our team is made of five international students. SPE has brought us together and given us this amazing opportunity to work together. So our team leader is Isa Tahini from SPE University of Aberdeen. Then Fatima al farsi from SPE Sultan Qaboos, Glory Amadife from SPE University of Nigeria, Cecilia Jones from SPE ITS, and me from SPE APU. So moving forward to today's speaker. So today's speaker that will be delivering the technical talk of petroleum economics is Mr. Saif Al Mamari. Mr. Saif Al Mamari is an economist is an economist at Oman's National Oil Company, OQ, with experience in the entire oil and gas value chain from exploration and production to refineries and petrochem. Uh, welcome, Mr. Saif. 
Thank you, Mariam. Thank you for that great introduction. So, Mr. Seb, I'll, I'll give you the floor. All right, thank you. So starting off, uh, just a brief about myself. Uh, as as uh, Mariam said, I've been working uh, in OQ for now three years. Uh, I started mainly in exploration and production, but uh, uh, due to an integration uh, of OQ Oman government assets, I've been lucky enough to be able to work in petrochemicals and refineries and also renewables. So I, I would like to share some of that at the end of, uh, of today's talk. So moving on, uh, starting off by defining what is petroleum economics. So petroleum economics is just capturing the economic concepts and principle to petroleum. So whatever you're going to learn today, you can still apply it uh, to any industry or any sector. Uh, and why you should learn it is because it's the, the decision maker in all of uh, petroleum decisions. So in your field development plan, the final section would be economics and management. Uh, it's the management indicator of uh, if to do this project or not, or to choose between projects. So basically the economic indicators is what really drives decisions. So the ultimate recovery and other technical aspects is part of it, but at the, at the end, the management really focuses on economics and uh, we'll go further into it. Uh, so in the next slide, uh, I, I wanna talk about the, how we get to these economic indicators. So you have the technical inputs, which is basically your production rate. Uh, so we will get from the reservoir engineers, how much uh, barrels or gas we're gonna produce per day uh, or annually. Then also we need capital expenditure. Capital expenditure is your investment cost. So this consists of uh, building facilities, drilling a new well, uh, any cost that uh, you will get an asset out of it that you can utilize to, to make revenue or save costs. Then you have your operating expenditure, uh, which is basically just your wages, your bills, any electricity you have to pay. It's just payments to keep everything afloat. So you get all these technical inputs and you get some economic assumptions. Mainly the biggest and most important economic assumption is the oil and gas price. The, so you get these two together and you put them in your economic model and you need to capture the applicable commercial contract, uh, which we call uh, a fiscal system or oil and gas contract, which is basically uh, to uh, how you can uh, know how much you have to pay to the government uh, for tax purposes. Uh, once you calculate all that, you will get your uh, cash flows and, and from there you can get your economic indicator and we'll go further later on. So starting uh, briefly on, on the oil and gas contracts in the next slide, there's two main uh, systems that, uh, that govern oil and gas uh, concession. So you have concession system and the contractual system, which is a production sharing agreement, PSA or uh, in other words also, the, it's called sometimes EPSA, Exploration and Production Sharing Agreement. So the concession agreement is more uh, rele uh, relevant and frequent in the West. So this is the system that get, gets used in the US uh, and UK and Western Europe. The PSA system is very common in the Middle East uh, and the East in Asia. It, it was first introduced in Indonesia in 1966. Um, and uh, the concession system is basically uh, a royalty on, on your revenue uh, slash production then an income tax that all oil and gas, uh, all companies uh, get. The production sharing agreement is a little different. Uh, so you have two, two, uh, two, two drivers of it, cost recovery and profit share. Cost recovery is a system where uh, you use the revenue to cover back your uh, capex and opex. And profit sharing is where you split the, whatever is remaining between the government and the contractor. Uh, so it's a different system. Uh, you, you sh as the name says, you share the actual uh, production with the with the government. So in the next slide, you can see uh, the the what makes each contract uh, different. So ownership of resources. So the the actual minerals, the reservoir, the under the ground, uh, it, under a consistent system, uh, the contractor owns that. But in the PSA, the sovereign state still holds uh, the ownership of that. So an example, if you're in the US and you buy a plot of land, anything that's below the ground is yours, whether it's gold, whether it's uh, gas, 
uh, if you're an example in Oman uh, and uh, you own a land, what even if there's a three TCF reservoir uh, under you, that the mineral rights is still with the government. Similar thing with the facility and infrastructure. If you build anything in concession system, the asset is yours. Under the PSA, the asset ownership is with the government. Uh, and management and control, really, in the concession system, there's no, mu there's not much regulation. Uh, there's a lot of regulation how to operate in terms of HSC and and carbon emissions, but in terms of petroleum decisions, where to drill, why to drill, how much to spend, the government isn't really interacting much uh, with the with the operator. Uh, under the PSA, there's normally technical meetings and a, and a finance meetings. There's a, a kind of a board between the, the operator and, and the government where the government has a say on petroleum operations. And finally, government participation. So there is no US NOC, a national oil company uh, in the US or the UK. But in PSA systems, you normally have companies like ADNO, like OQ, uh, like Qatar Petroleum that uh, if you explore somewhere and you find discovery, the country uh, and the government will will uh, invest in the uh, company via a government vehicle. Um, the next slide is just uh, briefly on other forms of taxation. So uh, this is more common in PSA systems. Is you have find things like signature bonuses. So you find a huge payment, uh, uh, an upper payment when you get concessions. There's also been introduction of carbon tax recently in some countries. There's mineral extraction tax in some countries. So there's many ways to tax uh, uh, the oil and gas industry. So moving along from this section, uh, I want to give a very basic example how you, you reach uh, a cash flow of a particular uh, time period. So here, uh, an example, we're producing 100,000 barrels of oil and the price was $50 per barrel. You just basic multiplication of, uh, uh, of the volumes with the price. Uh, you, we, got, we get a revenue of 5 million. Then you add all the operating costs, any wages, electricity, all, all, all the operating costs. Uh, then you deduct all your capital expenditure, all your investment costs, any exploration, any drilling. Then you apply uh, any taxes that's applicable. So, and, and this tax, uh, uh, tax will be dependent on the commercial con uh, contract you have. Then you'll reach your net cash flow. Uh, we'll show more examples later on. So the next section is the economic indicators. So uh, here we'll talk about what are those indicators and what's their purpose. Uh, but starting off, uh, I, I want to introduce a concept of time value of money. This, this concept is really important in economics and, and finance. It basically means that uh, a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow, which sounds very simple and basic, but it, it's the concept that drives all investment decisions. Uh, because a dollar today is worth more than a dollar in 10 years, I want to make a return out of that dollar that I'm, I'm losing today. Uh, so, it's, uh, so it becomes uh, worth it because uh, money today you can, you can earn interest on, whether it's in a bank, you can spend it on something else. So if you're going to invest it in, a, in an old concession, you're expected to get a return out of it. So, and, and the discount rate, net present value, uh, and the internal rate of return, IRR, are all the tools that factor in the time value of money. So in the next slide, so I've introduced uh, five economic indicators that I want to talk about. Uh, then we'll show some examples on them as well. So first of all, the discount rate. Uh, discount rate, there's many uh, terminology for it. Uh, discount rate, required rate of return, weighted average cost of capital, all means the same thing. It means basically it's the, it's the rate that uh, you, you require to, for that investment to make. This is the minimum rate I will accept. It can be uh, uh, a, a company policy or uh, the board of directors mandated a certain return on all investments. Uh, so, for example, if it's 10%, uh, any investment you have to make needs to make this 10% threshold. Uh, there's other ways of calculating the uh, weighted average capital cost, WAC, which is more of a theoretical uh, way of uh, building up your uh, discount rate. Then you have MPV. MPV is basically your net present value. Uh, it, it gives you, it basically brings all the future cash flow, uh, cash flow to today. So the, if you're investing today in 2021, 
and you have a project that's gonna you're gonna spend uh, three years exploring until let's say 2025 then uh, then you have a few years of investment and a few years of production so you have this 20 year cash flow period and M what mpv does it brings these cash flow uh, to today and and it uses the discount rate to discount every year uh, to get the mp uh, the, uh, the mpv to do it basically valuing future cash flow uh, today using the discount rate and as you move along further in the year uh, the discount becomes higher and higher uh, depending on the uh, on your required rate of return then you have the irr the irr the internal rate of return it basically measure, measures the return of the project uh, an easy way to think of it, it it's the uh, the uh, MPV is the uh, the required rate of return to make MPV zero, and and normally uh, you would accept these projects if the IRR is higher than your uh, discount rate, than your required company required rate. If the IRR is higher, you would accept this project. Uh, then with the payback period, it's a very simple uh, indicator, but uh, a very useful one as well. It's basically calculates when you start operation how long it takes for you to uh, re repay uh, all your initial investments. So it's basically when, at which point do you break even? How fast or how long uh, do you break even? And finally, UTC, unit technical cost. Uh, this is the cost per barrel of, uh, the cost of producing one barrel of oil. So you, uh, you, you get your total cost divided by total uh, uh, reserves and you get how much cost per barrel. Yeah, and, and the lower uh, it is, the better. So let's dive a bit deeper into each one of them, starting with the MPV in the next slide. So if we we have this example, uh, option A, uh, you have a, a negative 100 million the first year, 150, then 200. Then option B, you have a negative 50, 80, then 100. So if you sum up this cash flow, you will find that option A is a better investment because it has a cash flow of 150 versus 130 of option B. Uh, but this is this is when you don't factor in the time value of money. We see in the next slide. Here we will actually apply the discount rate and apply the MPV formula. So the formula formula goes as uh, in, in the denominator you will have one plus ten. Uh, we're assuming here the work would be ten percent, so you'll be one plus ten to the power of uh, of t, basically uh, the time period. So uh, the discount factor for 2022 will be 0 0.91, and you can see as you move on. During the years, uh, the discount rate uh, becomes lower. So the weightage of the more recent years is higher. That's the essence of the MPV and time value of money. So if we get in to see the MPV in, in option A, for example, in 2023, it's 150 million. Uh, but after multiplying the discount factor, you, you reach of a cash flow of 124 million. And when you add all this cash flow up, you, you get the MPV, all these discounted cash flows. So here you see, and actually, in my fact, option B is a better investment as it gives a 96 million and, uh, and 92 uh, versus against option A. So when we apply the discount factor, we know actually option B is a better investment. So in the same example, uh, we'll look at IRR in the next slide. Yeah, so you can see it's the exact same formula, except that uh, instead of the WAC discount rate, you replace it with the IRR and, and you make MPV equal to zero. And that, that's how you find the IRR. And here you can see that in option B, the IRR is 142% versus option A of 44%. So you, you, you see a huge difference. And it, it's, it, it's not really captured uh, this big difference when you look at the MPV. Because the, you, you recoup your money much quicker in the option B, the IRR appreciates that, so it gives a higher value. Uh, and, and, and basically you have a, because you spend only 50 million and regain uh, of more than 100 million, the, 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 uh, the IRR even rewards that against, uh, against spending 200 million to get 150 million in option A. So that's the essence of uh, IRR. In the next slide, we'll, we'll look at payback period. So payback period is a very simple uh, calculation. It's basically how long it takes for you to recoup your investment. So in 2021, you spend 80 million. Uh, your cumulative cash flow is negative 80. 2022, let's say you spend another 30. 
So you're uh, you're 110 million uh, uh, down. So and you start operation 2023. 20, this is when you start calculating your payback period. So you have 30 years of uh, 30 million cash flows. Uh, that brings you cumulative cash flow to 80. Then in, in your second year, you actually break even because you go you go above uh, zero. So in, by end of 2024, you reach 20 million dollars. So if we calculate that, it will take the full 2023, that's one year, and it will take some of 2024. So it's, uh, it, it's the payback period is between one and two years. Uh, if you normally, what you do, you take 2024 and divide it by month, and to know which month uh, it, it really you, you pay back. So uh, if, it's, uh, if it's in July, so it will, be, it will take you one, one year and seven months. Um, another way of calculating, if you don't know which year it is, you can assume the 100 million, you, you'll get them in equal payments uh, every month. So what you'll do, you'll take the cumulative cash flow of 80 divided by 100, you get 80% and multiply it by the months, 12 months. So that will give you roughly uh, 10 months. So in this example, uh, it'll be one year and 10 months. And then finally, our last indicator, UTC. Uh, so UTC is a very important indicator because it really tells you uh, how, how you're performing uh, against the market. So if, if UTC is, let's say, 20, $40, you'll know that if, uh, if the oil price is higher than 40, you'll be making profit. If it's under, you, you're losing money. So uh, what you do is you take the entire expenditure, uh, expenditure of the lifetime of the project, then divide it by reserves. Uh, you can do this for oil and gas. You can express it in dollar per barrel, or you can express it in dollar per MMBTU, or dollar per uh, MMSCOF, or BCF. Uh, in this example, we have a, we have a, a project that's uh, producing from 2024 until 2028, and there's costs from 2021. So you can see in the total, we sum up all the costs and all the volumes, and we just divide it, and here we get uh, uh, we get uh, from 1.2 billion divided by 30 million barrels of oil, we get $30 per barrel. So in this example, that uh, if oil price is higher than 30, uh, the project will be making money. If it's under 30, you'll be in the red. So th this is a really important QTC, uh, an important factor, especially recently when oil prices uh, crashed, uh, companies have become very aware of their UTCs. And the, all, uh, most companies have been rationalizing their portfolios to keep only low UTC blocks to be protected in case of uh, another pandemic happens or another crash like 2014. Uh, so finally, in summary, in the economic indicator, uh, so companies will use all these five factors together. They, they, they don't run independently and, and every company will have a higher weight in a specific indicator. So the, you, your discount rate or required rate of return you'll use to calculate your MPV. If it's positive, then uh, it's a go ahead. Uh, for the IRR, you use a discount rate to know uh, if it's higher than your, than your required rate of return, then, then the project is good. But if we give an example, if a certain project, let's say project A, has a much higher MPV than project B, but project B has a, a shorter payback period uh, than project A, a company might opt in to take project B, even though we know the value of this block is better, uh, but uh, is worse than project A. But because of uh, the, the company's specifications or, uh, or need, uh, they might be in a cash shortage, they will put a high, much higher weight on the payback period. Uh, same thing with the UTC. If, uh, if a block that has higher MPV but has a higher UTC as well, you might opt into the lower UTC. You say, okay, my company strategy is to, to have the lowest UTC possible in case uh, anything else uh, like 2020 or 2014 happen again, I want to be protected. Uh, and, yeah, and so this concludes the uh, economic indicators section. Uh, so briefly, it's off topic. I want to talk about beyond ENP. Uh, so this is, Basic in the next slide. Uh, yes, so I, I want to talk about what happens after exploration and production. So what happens after uh, you produce your oil and uh, or gas? Uh, 
and uh, really it's outside of uh, petroleum economics. Petroleum economics is really upstream if it's exploration and production. But I wanted to give a brief, uh, just uh, so you can understand the, uh, understand the dynamics of uh, oil and gas. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, uh, you know, normally where you'll start off, you, you'll have your upstream facilities where you produce your oil and gas, then you have uh, the midstream section. This could be truckage. This could be uh, uh, this could be this could be trucks. This could be pipelines, uh, or, and then they're, they're they're transported to downstream. And downstream is refining petrochemical. Uh, if it's diesel, they refine it. Then then we go to retail. So basically, your pumps in in, in on the street. Uh, in in the next slide. Uh, I want to give a bit more on refining specifically. So, because in oil and gas, we, we have two products, only oil and gas. Uh, and we, we have a market price for oil and a market pr uh, price for gas, whether it's LNG or, or, uh, or just natural gas. Uh, but what moves these two factors, what, what plays in the supply and demand of these two products is all these products that come after it, that comes uh, further downstream of oil and gas. Uh, so in this example, this is a, a, a very basic uh, refinery setup. What you see in this uh, tube here is called a CDU, a crude oil distillation unit, and it basically separates uh, all these products uh, by boiling point. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, so you'll have uh, products like uh, refinery gas, which is basically LPG, gasoline that you'll use for cars, NAPSA, you will further go downstream to produce petrochemicals, kerosene, such jet fuel uh, uh, for uh, aircraft, and also diesel for cars, buses, and fuel oil for ships and power stations. Uh, so, uh, so you can see that oil and gas, the demand of each of these projects, diesel, gasoline, will affect the, ultimately the oil price. Uh, and how, how refineries make money is basically they buy crude, uh, and, and sell these products. Uh, and we see a lot of companies, a lot of ICs are well integrated. So they've integrated their upstream with their downstream as well. Uh, so they become one giant operation. So your shells and BPs have parts in all of these stages, whether it's upstream, midstream, and downstream. Uh, finally, in the next slide, uh, this is one of my favorite uh, figures because it shows you how big uh, oil and gas is really. And, uh, how how much it covers. So this is the petrochemical sections. Uh, I really encourage you to I put the link of it uh, uh, on the top right corner uh, to look at this uh, at this PDF yourself. And uh, because it's really hard to see in the slide because there is just so many products that come from crude oil and natural gas. So the first step is uh, so you you have your main product naphtha, ethane, propane, and methane, and from there you birth all your petrochemical products. This includes electronics, uh, automobile uh, parts, uh, even renewable energy, wind, wind turbines, and solar panels use petrochemicals, clothing, sportswear. Uh, it's essentially in everything. And, um, and, and also, these petrochemicals demand also affects the oil price as they take uh, basically a chunk of the barrel and demand of uh, a specific barrel. Uh, so yeah, uh, this uh, concludes uh, the petroleum economic section, and I'll hand it off to Mariam for the Q and A. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Saif, for targeting petroleum economics indicators, explaining about the different fiscal systems and taxations, and discussing about petrochemicals by the end of the session. That was such an informative session, and uh, now the floor is open for questions uh, from the audience. So uh, we are, wait, let me just, uh, yeah, okay. So we are starting with our first question from Abdallah from SPAPU Sutton chapter. He asks you, Mr. Saif, if you could please clarify the economic indicator UTC again. So does it mean if the oil price is more, you are on loss? And if you are below, you are making profit? No, so the great question. So the UTC is basically, uh, the cost of producing one barrel. So the, the lower it is, the better for you. So if we say the UTC is $40, then 
that means uh, you need to spend forty dollars for each barrel you have to produce. So what that means to break even, you, you need for the oil price to be forty. So if the oil price is higher, uh, you'll be making money. So once the oil price is lower than UT the UTC, then you are losing. So uh, it's the opposite. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the clarification. I hope that answered your question, Abdullah. So for next question, um, if you have any questions, just please drop it in the meeting chat box. And uh, yeah, so our next question is, what is the benefit of production sharing agreements? Asked so, by, yeah, go ahead, Mr. Saif. Yeah, so the production sharing agreement against concession system, it was introduced because it, it, uh, it's a system that uh, helps both the government and, and the operator. Uh, so the system is basically, you, you have a cost recovery system where all the revenue before you pay any taxes goes to the operator until the, the, the operator repay their costs. Then whatever is left, uh, gets divided uh, uh, in uh, between the government and uh, and the operator. It was built against the concession system to encourage more exploration uh, uh, for uh, these countries. So uh, in, in the concession system, it's it's very rigid that it, it takes money regardless of your if you're making profit or not, if you're doing well or not. It takes it straight from the revenue, straight from the production line. But with the with the production sharing agreement is uh, much more favorable and fair in the term is uh, if you uh, because you have the cost recovery system you recoup some of your investment before uh, you pay any tax basically. I hope that answers it. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Safe. Uh, we have another question uh, from the audience uh, with the energy transition. Carbon taxation is slowly becoming part of the equation. Do some companies prior to prioritize that more than the money value? I mean, we can see it uh, with BP and Shell with their uh, with their strategy, with their new strategies that they want to be uh, carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, so all of these IOCs are have have this carbon credit system in place to reduce carbon emissions. So yes, it is a factor in the, for a lot of companies. Okay, so thank you. So that's for carbon taxation. Um, our next question is uh, by Mr. Hazik from SPKL. Uh, he's asking if you can explain how volatility of oil price affects petroleum economics when it comes to producing loans. Okay, uh, I mean, uh, no, with volatility, it's it's oil prices basically creates the economics of oil and gas. So, if the markets are down, uh, getting loans will be more expensive uh, and harder to get. If the prices are optimistic, uh, it'll be easier to get loans. But you can see it immediately because oil price is very hard to predict uh, uh, year by year. You can see decisions get taken by in the short term. Uh, so uh, when oil price was improving uh, in the 2018, 19, uh, you see, you saw a huge uh, increase in shale oil production. Once uh, the, the oil price crashed, you, you saw cut, a huge cut on investment. Uh, this will also reflect in lending in a similar way. When the markets are up, you see more liquidity, but when the markets are down, uh, you'll see less uh, lending available. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Saif. So, um, for our next question, um, there's a question by uh, Jivashini from SVAPU. Can you explain about the government's production sharing contracts? Yeah, so, uh, which is basically the PSA or an EPSA, uh, Exploration Production Sharing Agreement, or the Production Sharing Agreement. These are contracts typically in, in the in, in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. 
Uh, so normally when you sign these contracts, uh, you, you have a right to produce in a certain concession uh, or a certain block. Uh, and part of this agreement, there will be a, a, a section on cost recovery, a rate uh, where uh, you can get uh, your money to recover your cost. This will be a percentage. Then you have a percentage, uh, a percentage of profit share. Uh, if we have, if I can throw an example, uh, let's say uh, in a certain agreement, the production, uh, the cost recovery rate is sixty percent, and a pro uh, uh, and a profit share for the contract is forty percent. So what will happen then? Uh, once you you start producing, sixty percent of that uh, balance will be used to recover your costs, and the remaining forty percent will be divided forty sixty. 40 to the contract and 60% to the government. Uh, it could be the, the sharing agreement could be in kind, so you can share volume to the government, or it could be uh, in cash, so you, you share them a percentage of the revenue. Yeah. Okay, thank you for clarifying about the production uh, contract, chain contract. Um, okay, there's another question by SPKL Hazik. Uh, he said, as an economist, what is your opinion on carbon credits versus carbon capital? Should we encourage companies to emit less or allow them to emit more and focus on, uh, on CCUS to put them away? Okay, I, I have to admit I'm not a, really an expert uh, in carbon tax and carbon emissions, uh, but it's really hard to say which uh, you're supposed to focus on. It really depends on which, where, where you operate. Uh, if you operate in Europe and you know that uh, uh, that policies will be stringent, you would move on to, to look at the carbon credits. But uh, it really depends on what's your view on regulations. Uh, it's still not clear. Will, will there be a global carbon tax on oil and gas companies? Uh, Will the U.S. apply these carbon uh, taxes as well, um, uh, or even Asian countries? We we don't really see the, these policies in the Middle East, so uh, I think we'll have to wait and see for that one. Yeah, hopefully. Um, all right. So moving on to our last question for the session. Would you recommend petroleum economics for people with petroleum engineering background or more to people who come from finance field? Uh, I, I recommend it for both. Uh, uh, this is actually part of my closing remark. Uh, uh, for, for engineers, definitely focus on your uh, specialty. But after building that foundation, learning, uh, learning petroleum economics will help you become more aware why your company makes certain decisions, and uh, it it might uh, give you even future chances, say five years, ten years down the line, uh, if you want to move uh, uh, to business development, to planning, uh, to have that foundation plus petroleum economics, uh, it'll be a, a strong combo. Yeah. All right. Um... Thank you. I think there's, there's more questions. So, um, yeah, can you just go through them quickly just to answer the audience? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, thank you, Mr. Say. Uh, let me close this. All right, so there's a question from Glory from SPUNN. So her question is a bit different but related. So she's asking you what will happen to the supply of petroleum products since the world is going towards renewable energy? I mean, uh, we still don't know uh, how fast renewable energy is going to grow. So what we know that energy demand is growing and uh, at a higher rate than renewable energy. Uh, so for sure, uh, as a percentage, our weightage use of oil and gas will decrease compared to renewables. But the actual volume of it, uh, it looks like for now, it, it, we will need actually more uh, than we produce right now. Uh, so it's really difficult to say. It, it, depends, uh, uh, it depends on how fast renewables grow uh, and how much they can compete economically with the oil and gas. But, what, uh, but let's say that the point we reach to that point at some stage in the future, 
uh, basically the supply it will recorrect itself so the old price will crash uh, people will invest less and, and, and therefore you, you decrease your reserves uh, uh, so it's just the market will take, will handle that by by essentially by just reducing oil price okay thank you for the clarification uh, there's another question so this estimation is mainly forecasting what is the mechanism or factors to determine the future oil price price mind sharing your experiences during the dropping of oil prices last year i think during the pandemic yeah yeah, uh, uh, to be honest, I'm not really, uh, uh, we have a different department for specifically just a team that looks just at an oil price and, and downstream prices. We have a market intelligence team that just purely look, look at that. Uh, and, and so we, in economics, we, we actually feed, we get in the oil price from them. Uh, but yeah, uh, estimation is uh, uh, always difficult uh, with, oil, uh, with oil price. Uh, so uh, you can see, like, uh, if you go back uh, uh, a year ago and see each company's uh, forecast and look at it again this year, you can see a huge difference in just one year in, in the forecast. So forecasting oil prices uh, is very tricky. Uh, okay, so we can move to uh, a question and a comment from Mohammed al Valushi. Uh, he told you thank you, say for a wonderful and insightful presentation. One last question to leave you with the audience, uh, to leave you and the audience with. If you had to go back in time to the time that you were doing finance major or when you had first entered um, OQ as an economist, what would be the one thing that you would change or go about differently? Mm, okay, uh, that's a tough question from Henrik. Um... I don't know. I, I think uh, uh, when I entered on gas, I had uh, really no expectation or no much knowledge of the industry. Uh, I learned it. Uh, I actually, uh, when I was in college, that was the only industry I didn't want to get into in Oman because everyone goes into oil and gas. Uh, maybe that, that thinking I, I would like to change because once I got into it, uh, especially in Oman, how big the oil and gas industry compared to all other industries, I, I'm so glad I'm in now. But I think just my perception of oil and gas back when I was in college uh, would be it. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Saif. There's another question uh, from Harizi from SPUTM. Uh, thank you for the one the first session. Will the energy transition play a role in changing the definition of economic terms? in oil and gas industry, such as UTC and taxation policies? And how much of an effect is expected since reduction in the mentioned terms is expected when leading towards renewables? Uh, so they will affect the economic indicators for sure, uh, 100%. So, uh, so uh, let's say if, if you have uh, a carbon tax, you, you'll need to add it to your taxes, thus decreasing your cash flow, thus decreasing your MPV. Uh, and probably uh, a big uh, factor would be is how, mu how much carbon emissions will this project produce. So this might be an actual an important indicator along with your other economic indicators for choosing a project. Uh, so uh, we'll have to wait to see and see uh, when these policies come into play, but definitely uh, it, it will affect uh, your decision making. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Say, for taking your time and answering all the questions from the audience. Uh, I believe that was the last question. So uh, by this, we can move forward to the Kahoot game session. So uh, for this session, I'll pass the floor to my teammate, Glory, that she present the Kahoot game. Glory, the floor is yours. Hey guys, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to the Kahoot session. I hope you can hear me. Please, if you can hear me, can I get a yes or something? Yes, yes we can. Yes. 
Yes, yes, yes we can. can. Okay, okay, thank you. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. You're welcome to the childhood section. <laughs> okay, you're welcome to the childhood section. It's going to be a fun time, and I want you all to relax and enjoy yourselves. Please, for this childhood section, I would need you to use your use your nicknames, not your real names, kind of. So you could use the QR code or log, in, log on to kahoot.it and then when you're done logging in, you could share, you could see the screen being shared, then that's the pin for the Kahoot game. The pin is 5040995. 5040995. So I'm waiting for you guys. Hmm. Oh, we could see Chris, we could see Jesus here, Dita is here, no fat is here, Pisa is here. So remember to use your nickname, please. And not to forget, oh, there's Krishna too. <laughs> not to forget, this. after this Kahoot, there will be, oh, real glory. No, I'm the real glory here. <laughs> there's only one glory. <laughs> okay, fine. Okay, there will be a prize for the winner of the scouts. So I want you to take it very serious. There's a prize for the winner of the scouts and you could, the person that wins this would have to screenshot and send to the email that was sent to, oh, Wakanda forever. Wow. <laughs> I love this name I'm saying. Okay, wait for more questions. You have to wait to participants already. And wait for, okay, you see I have some time to wait. Okay, gotcha. Oh, COVID-19. Everybody wear your face mask. <laughs> There's COVID-19 on the call. Please wear your face mask. <laughs> okay. We have winner. Uh, are you sure? You better win. Winner, you better win. Okay. Okay, we have... Uh, there are some names I can't even pronounce here. We have one one. Oh, cool. Okay, we'll still wait for more participants. We have two minutes to join. I think we'll start by... 2 p.m. according to my time here. Uh, are we all done joining? Oh, we have champion. <laughs> all these amazing names, you better win. And read glory, you better win. <laughs> oh, shh. Oh, I'm going to talk. Shh. Shall we talk? I don't know, but I'm going to talk. I don't... <laughs> okay. Are we still waiting for more questions? We have since. Ronaldo, oh, cool. I don't, uh, I don't think, well, well, you're not the real Ronaldo, so I don't know. Okay. Uh, and it's when one minute I will start game. The technician, oh, you guys should watch out for that guy. <laughs> oh, ABC. Hmm. Cool. And we have one more minute I will start. We have 23 participants. Oh, I can say, oh, hi, I. Okay. So, okay, it's time. And oh, there's a past six. Oh, we're going to, okay, it's not yet two o'clock. So my time is still 1 to 9 p.m. I'm still waiting. And once it's two o'clock, we start. We have uh, Kim Jong Jong. Interesting, we have. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. We have Kim Jong Jong, Ami, Ike, ABC, Renato, Shh, Shh, AZ, Champion, Eman, HSE, COVID 19, Free Hearts, Wakanda Forever, Unicorn One, One One, Haziri, Winner, The Technician, Sinovac, MS99, Real Glory. I'm still saying I'm the Real Glory here. Here we have Mahinda and Jetran, Chris, Jesus. Oh, awesome glory. Interesting. Mm. <laughs> okay, so let's let the game begin. I just love that sound that comes with the beginning of the game. Just listen. Oh, okay. I think I, I you guys can hear the sound, right? No. Glory, we don't hear the sound. Please share the sound. Uh, okay. Oh, oh. Can you hear the sound now? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, no, no. Okay. 
I didn't get that screen. Uh, it's it's quite low. Yeah. Lori, it's quite okay, low. Can okay. you turn, turn the music high? Okay, that's done. I love that particular standard. That's wine. That's that's the sound I'm talking about. You hear you can hear there's it. There's well. no voice. So, there's no sound. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, but you hear it later. So for the winners of this particular question, we have 19 persons. Oh, that's it's quite simple then. 19 persons won this, and we have that's the who, who are those persons. Whoa, we have my hidden on the lead, we have Iman H, and we have Rick Glory. Yes, yes, and we have winner, and we have Fiza. Okay, Rick Glory, you better win, and winner too. Which of the below is considered a capital expenditure? Is it wages and salary, electricity? That's a lot. Yeah. Drilling a new well. All these are questions that was going through the class. If you're, if you're online, you could have known the answers by now. That's the sound. Why? I, I'm going to visit China for that, honestly. Yeah, because of that stand, I'm going to visit China anyway. Anyway, so 19 persons too. Wow, the answer is drilling a new well. Okay, and who is on the lead? <gasps> Regular is second. And we have Mehiden. Oh, cool. That's it. And we have champion as a fourth, AC as a third, as a fourth, sorry, champion as a fifth. Wow. <laughs> Another question, what best describes the required rate of return? Is it discount rate, net present value, unit technical cost? What best describes the required return, rate of return? Hmm, discount rate. Okay, we have 11 persons got that, and that's cool. Anyway, let's see who are those people. <gasps> Rick Glory, you just have to pass me hidden, and you may be my best person. <laughs> so we have Peter as a third champion coming up, cool. And AZ, the, uh, the fifth person. Payback period is the time period it takes to recoup the initial investment, time period where profit is maximized, time it takes, time frame it takes, this work. So what's payback period? I think it's like this. Oh, time. <laughs> so payback period is a time period it takes to recoup the initial investment oh since we got that wow and ah, maybe it's not going down oh anyway we glory the second i don't know but then pizza is third champion is first these guys are not going anywhere i thought i saw awesome glory in the call awesome glory is not here ronaldo ronaldo is not here i don't know <laughs> all the amazing names i'm not seeing there Anyway, I'm proud of Reed Glory. Natural gas and liquefied natural gas is normally priced in, okay, dollar per BBL, then dollar per MMV2, and dollar per turn, I think for that. Yeah. Yeah, one. So we have dollar per MMBTU. Uh, just 13 persons got that right. And who are they? Ah, champion is coming up. <gasps> COVID-19. Um, well, we need our face masks. Honestly, <laughs> everybody needs face masks in this game. COVID-19, COVID-19 cannot win. <laughs> please. <laughs> Anybody can win, but not COVID-19, please. <laughs> so we are waiting, and then we have the next question. Under which fiscal system does the government intervene in operations? Is it concessionary agreements, production sharing agreements, petroleum license? Hmm. 
Let's do it. Understand? All of that's unparticular. So if production sharing agreement, just 18 persons got that. And uh, uh, COVID-19 is coming up. We go race today. Then may he then. Somebody should bring down may he then, but not COVID-19. <laughs> so let's go. So now, what best describe the unique technical cause you to see? I think I saw that. Okay. Is it the cost of producing one barrel of oil? The cost of drilling one well? The cost of petroleum? It is the cost of producing one barrel of oil. And 19, oh, 19 persons got that. That's cool. And oh, maybe oh, Wakanda forever. Thank you for doing the impossible. <laughs> and then we have Mahine, we have Re Glory. Re Glory is cool. Uh, you just need to bring them Mahine and you have, you mm -hmm. have, okay, let me just hold it. And Champion is third, Eman Hitch, then Wakanda forever. That's cool. At least COVID 19 is out of the game anyway. I don't know. The internal rate of return is used for determining which project to choose, calculating the discount rate, measuring efficiency. So which is it? Which is it? Internal rate of return. It's determining which project to choose. Okay, I um I want to ask one question. This particular sound, is it when they hear so you bow? I need to Chinese. I think that's in the comment section. I'm going to check when that sound is hit, and then you have to bow or something. I really want to know because it's um, anyway. It's going to be my message sound very soon. So it's determining which project to choose, and just ten persons got that. Oh, I had a hard question anyway. So oh. Okay, fine. Maiden is still leading. I'm really glorious second. Champion is third. Physics is fourth. And Evan H is fifth. Maiden. Which of the below correctly defines the net present value, MPV? Is it a sum of cash flows, sum of cash flows adjusting for internal rate of return, or sum of cash flows adjusting for the discount rate? Which is it? So it's the sum of cash flows adjusting for the discount rate. All right. So just seven persons. Oh, that's four. That's seven persons got that. And our manager is in the lane. And really glory second. And then we have champion episode. So. Production sharing agreement is more like to be practiced in North America, Western Europe, Middle East. So let's get that. Uh, so we have 15 persons got that. Oh, that's good. And who's the winner? Let's see who the winner is. Oh, we have the Oh, champion. Oh, <laughs> and Ray Glory. <laughs> and uh, I am Ray Hayden. <laughs> Congratulations to the winners, anyway. And you can do well to. Okay, um, you have to screenshot this and send to the email address at the, on the chat box so you can receive your prize. Yes, it's a prize for the winner. And Rick Glory, you've been awesome too. And awesome Glory, I didn't see you anywhere anyway. But um, thank you guys for the session. I hope you enjoyed the section. And please, we have other times to enjoy as well. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Glory, for this uh, session game. It was actually really fun. And yes, yeah, so moving forward, 
Uh, let me share back my screen. Okay. So yeah, after this fun Kahoot game session, we are having a photo session. So now I will ask everyone in the audience to please turn on the camera, use the virtual background and put on a big smile and let's take a picture just here virtually with the speaker. So let's go everyone. Yes, I see more faces. <laughs> right. <laughs> you don't know how to wait. <laughs> Come on, guys, just turn on your video. Even if you didn't get the video, it's fine. Okay. Please know who is Muhaydin, because you won both the boot. <laughs> Yes, we need the Kahoot games. <laughs> Jay, like I can see Right. Let's go. There's less than half that turned on the video. So let's go, everyone. Give me one more mm -hmm. minute. All right, so let's take our first picture. So a big smile, everyone. Oh, my smile. <laughs> okay. All right, last pause. <laughs> Okay, I think we got the pictures. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> okay, now let's go back to... Okay, voila. Okay, so now is uh, the feedback form. So please, I advise everyone to fill up the feedback form from the link provided in the, in the meeting chat box or by scanning this QR uh, code right here that is shared with you to get your certificate of participation for today's technical talk. So we're gonna give it like two minutes for you to scan or join the link. And yeah, meanwhile, if you would like to watch this informative session that we had today about petroleum economics, you can always rewatch it through SP APU YouTube channel or SP Kuala Lumpur Young Professional uh, YouTube channel too. Uh, both of the channels, the link will be also dropped in the meeting chat box. So don't forget to go subscribe, like, and turn on the notification button so you can stay tuned for our upcoming events and activities. All right, I believe everyone, everyone should be should have already scanned the QR code by now. So now let's move on to the close. No, I'm sorry. Now we're moving on to a reminder for our next Saturday. So our next Saturday will be on 18th September 2021. We are having a career workshop. And for the technical talks, it will be about the new energy or the energy transition. So stay tuned and please uh, be there. So we all gonna see you next week. It's gonna be a more uh, interactive and informative session. So yeah, this is the poster. Take a screenshot of this or put it, add it in your calendar so you won't miss it out. Great. So following that will be our closing remarks. So for the closing remarks, I leave the floor to Mr. Saif. Thank you, Mariam. Uh, so what I wanted to say it in the end, I kind of touched, up, uh, touched upon it in the Q&A session. Um, basically, I know that petroleum economics is a, is a subject that 
normally gets looked over uh, in the petroleum uh, engineering curriculum, which is uh, fair enough because you really need to focus uh, on those subjects first. Uh, but I hope this session uh, br brought petroleum economics to your mind. Uh, and I encourage you to, to have an open mind on it uh, in the future, because uh, learning uh, petroleum economics and keeping up to date what's happening in oil price, uh, it really helps you to, to understand why your company are making uh, certain decisions. Um, and also building up that knowledge will help you if you want it uh, later on in your career to move, to come with us to the dark side, to economics and planning and our business development or commercial. Uh, so all, all these uh, departments within your organization, if you, if you go into them with your technical foundation, you become a very, very strong uh, candidate uh, uh, for those roles uh, and with that uh, uh, with that I end and I really I want to thank uh, SPE uh, for hosting this event and organizing it and uh, and inviting me to talk a uh, special thank you of course to Mariam Isa and uh, all the organization or the organizers for today's talk uh, I really hope uh, you enjoyed uh, today's session and uh, and uh, hopefully it was uh, informative uh, at least a little bit uh, and yeah I hope you have uh, a good end of the day or uh, rest of the day or a good uh, rest of the night. Thank you, Mr. Saif, and thank you, the team. Thank you, everyone, for this fun, interactive, and informative session about petroleum economics. And I would like to thank everyone for joining. And yes, so by this, that will be the end of today's technical talk. So see you all next week. And thank you for being with us here today. I hope you learned something and had fun. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank everyone. Thank Bye. You, everyone. Thank you, Mrs. Saif. Thanks, Mariam and Glory and Isa. Thank you. Thank you all. See you next week. Thank you, Mariam. Thank you, everyone.